My name is Kathy Camp. I'm the Executive Director of the Wisconsin Partnership for Housing Development. Uh, we're a, a nonprofit. Uh, we're a statewide nonprofit, but we're located uh, in Dane County, and we do a, a lot of work in Dane County. Uh, most of the work that the Wisconsin Partnership does uh, is centered around single-family housing development. Uh, and we've worked in the city of Madison, and we also work uh, at creating some smaller rental programs in some of the surrounding communities in Dane County. Um, but I am part of a group called the Third Sector, and the Third Sector uh, is, is um, a, a collaboration of local nonprofits, uh, most of whom have been around for years and years, uh, in the Madison area. And the, the point uh, and the sort of goal of this presentation uh, is to make everyone aware of the local resources that are available uh, within Dane County uh, that can be uh, called on, so you can tap into these resources. Uh, if you need uh, some housing assistance within your community. Uh, here's a listing of the groups that are in the third sector. Uh, and again, many of these have been around for a very long time. You can see um, some of the dates of founding. Uh, and, and many of them focus on a variety of activities. Some people focus on particular neighborhoods. Uh, some people focus on particular development activities. Uh, and some focus on serving a particular population. Uh, so they all have their niche uh, across the continuum of care that's Dane County. Um, and this is the overview, and we have three organizations that are going to talk a little bit in, um, in more detail about some of the things that they do um, and give you some uh, more information. Uh, but the rest of these, uh, you have some descriptions uh, in the handout that is available to you uh, that gives you information on the units that are owned uh, by various groups and the types of services uh, that are provided. Can I uh, just make a comment? So on your slide, you have Commonwealth Development. I just want to say it is Commonwealth, two words. Oh, okay. And they're yep. listed as one because there is also an organization called Commonwealth oh, Development Company. So two very distinct organizations. And um, I, I um, thank you for saying that. And the Commonwealth uh, that's listed in third sector is one that is local to Madison. Um, so some of the nonprofit developers that are located uh, in the city of Madison operate statewide, but nevertheless focus a lot of their development activities in Dane County. Um, and as I mentioned, we provide a, a wide and broad range of services, uh, and they really range across the continuum of care from homelessness uh, to home ownership assistance. Um, these uh, nonprofits have been in our community for years, uh, and they really recognize the local problems and local issues uh, and work at the policy level as well as uh, the neighborhood level to make change. Uh, one of the goals uh, for all the third sector groups uh, is that we want to create permanent affordable housing. Uh, we want it to, to be affordable. If you're going to invest money in it, we want it to be affordable uh, over time, not just for 10 years or 15 years. Uh, and as nonprofit developers, we're committed to doing that. Um, we're mission driven and we are people focused, so we, <coughs> we look at the population that we're trying to serve uh, and, and we de develop programs around uh, those policies. Uh, we're all governed by volunteer boards, uh, and when we make a profit, it's reinvested into the projects uh, that advance uh, our activities in the community. So if I make money from a housing development project, I, I drive it into additional. Uh, housing. We think that that's really important to know. Um, we also provide and coordinate services uh, so that people uh, have long-term housing stability. We might not provide every service within our organization, but we know who else does, uh, and we can put people in touch. I think most importantly, uh, as a group, we drive social change uh, in our community, and we try and help, help communities develop policies that further uh, the mission of access to affordable housing. Um, we serve a lot of different populations. Uh, some serve people who are chronically homeless. Uh, some, some serve that population that's low income but still can't afford housing. Uh, and then there's other nonprofit developers uh, who really make it possible for lower income households uh, to purchase a home uh, and become incredibly stable and build wealth uh, within the neighborhood. Uh, all of those services are necessary uh, and, and what your community needs uh, will dictate uh, which group you might reach out to uh, within the third sector. Um, as you noted, we've been around for a long time, and because of that, um, most of the third 
the third sector developers uh, have been responsible for a lot of the innovation and a lot of the change uh, that's happened in our communities. Uh, and we do like to work creatively and innovatively. So if there's an issue in a community, um, you know, we try to address that. Uh, and it does mean um, looking at all different kinds of housing and different kinds of housing policy. Typically what we find as obstacles to our work, and I'm sure you can all, uh, you can all understand this, is uh, the resources. As someone was saying earlier, we need resources, we need resources, we need resources. Um, and we do need those resources. We need capital to invest in affordable housing, uh, but we also need to make sure that we're investing it uh, in the way that will serve the population for, in the best way for the longest possible time. Um, and I think that one of the things that we recognize is that because we're serving those incredibly low-income families, um, we can't necessarily go out and take a mortgage out to buy a rental parcel um, because if we take a mortgage out, we're going to have to charge rents that are too high uh, for the population that we serve uh, to afford. Uh, and so what we try and do is limit the amount of, of mortgage that we place on a property so we can keep the rents lower um, but that obviously means ahead of time we're having to uh, raise a lot more money uh, than we might have if we, if we were able to charge those higher rents. Uh, so we advocate for state, local, and federal support uh, for low-income housing projects, and a lot of what the third sector does uh, does relate to advocacy. Um, so as I said, we're going to hear from uh, three organizations, uh, more specifically about the services that they provide. Um, and we'll start with Sarah, who's with The Road Home. Good morning, everyone, or I guess we're getting close to afternoon. Um, thank you all for joining us in this room and, and at this conference. I, I'm, I'm probably not alone in thinking it's a wonderful day to be out of the office and walking along the lake getting here. It was perfect. Um, so I'm glad we can all be here today. Uh, I am representing The Road Home Dane County, and my role at The Road Home is this fancy title of nonprofit strategist. It's a one-year role that's focused on capacity building and growth for the organization. It's a gift and pleasure to be working at The Road Home, but it's a little bit unfortunate that my role even exists because what it means is homelessness and affordable housing issues are growing in our community, and The Road Home needs to be thinking about that growth and how they're going to respond to it. So The Road Home is focused on uh, the idea that every child deserves a home, and we are the only organization in Dane County that specifically focuses only on families experiencing homelessness. We have many partner organizations that we're working with that do a lot of different things, including family homelessness, but we are exclusively focused on that population. Um, just to set a little bit of context, I think sometimes people are a little bit taken aback when they even hear the idea of family homelessness because it doesn't necessarily come to mind, the idea of a newborn baby or a two-year-old or a five-year-old that has no place to sleep. But unfortunately, in Dane County, that's happening every day. Um, our current housing priority list has about 150 families on it that do not have a place to sleep tonight. So this is not a small problem, it's a very real problem going on. Um, and especially, we also see often kind of an invisible part of the, the homeless population is folks that are doubled up, and they might not show up on that housing priority list, but they might not know from day to day or week to week if they're gonna be able to stay at the place they've been staying. So they might stay with a friend for a little while, then with their grandma, then with a neighbor, and they are not captured in any of our data very well, but we know that these folks are just a step away from potentially entering our shelter system. And we think there could be up to 600 families right now in Dane County that are in that boat. So we have a, a problem that we really need to keep working to address because it's unacceptable to think that there's newborn babies on our streets tonight without a place to go. Um, and in terms of why this is such a problem, I think it's, it's obvious in some ways, right? We know that it's traumatic for anyone to be without a house, mm -hmm. but when you think of a toddler or a teenager without a house, the effects of that trauma become even more profound. A couple of stats that I've put up here that often stick with me um, and that I think are important to share um, is that children that are experiencing homelessness are two times more likely to go hungry. Makes sense, right? Because if you don't have a kitchen, if you don't have a fridge, is it, are the odds high that you're gonna be able to consistently have dinner at night? Not necessarily. Um, children are three times more likely to have emotional and behavioral problems. And what does this really mean and where does it really play out? Often in school or childcare settings, where kids that are experiencing homelessness are not able to focus, they're not able to pay attention, they're dealing with that trauma of instability, and this sets them back. It's not just about their house, it's about the fact that they can't learn and grow with their peers. 
Um, the last thing that really devastates me to think about is the fact that homeless children are four times more likely to get sick than their peers. And this example really sticks out to me right now as we approach germ season. Um, I have a five-month-old daughter, um, my first kiddo, and she's in daycare, and she's already gotten two colds in like two months, and she's able to feel better because she's coming home and has a place to sleep at night, and that's making her feel stronger, right? And, and she's still getting those germs. But for a kid without a place to come home to and sleep, are they even going to be able to get better? Or that cold be persistent and turn into a bigger problem? Um, we see that happening, and it's really, really, really traumatic for our kids. Um, all that being said, we are working on addressing these issues with our kids and families because we know that strengthens our community. Um, and some, some statistics that I put up here that are important to keep in mind, why, why should we focus on family homelessness as a community? Because it's much more cost effective to house families or individuals than it is to have them in shelter. It might cost $3,000 a month to have a family staying at Salvation Army, but that $3,000 a month is probably gonna more than pay for an apartment that if they were able to use that as rent. So it's really not a cost-effective solution to keep families in shelter. Um, we know that case management that can wrap support around families is gonna stabilize them and get long-term results. So we're not just having a point-in-time intervention and then walking away, but when we're working with families, we're providing wraparound support. That means they're likely to stabilize and really become a deep and important part of our community and be able to grow and reach goals and succeed. Um, and the other thing that's important to mention is this idea that housing stability is going to allow for overall stability, and this is the idea of housing first. So I'm sure plenty of folks in this room have heard this philosophy before, but housing first is the idea that first we provide housing to someone in need, and then they're able to address other barriers. It's easy to think of this, why this makes sense, right? It would be pretty hard to overcome addiction or to deal with a mental health issue or to even get ready for a job interview if you're trying to do that from the shelter. People do it every day. They are making ends meet because they're resilient. But it makes much more sense to first provide a house to someone to say, you have a roof over your head and now let us strive to meet your goals. Let us strive to work together to, to move forward. Um, I also want to just give a little context on our system because the road home does not work alone by any means on this issue of family homelessness and homelessness overall. We're part of a very strong system that especially in the past five years or so um, has been able to really consolidate resources and become very efficient at meeting the needs of families. So one thing I mentioned, that housing priority list with 100 people, 150 people, households on it in our community, that list is created and accessed by all the partner agencies in Dane County that work with homeless families. So we know that our resources are being deployed together. We're not having seven different staff at seven different agencies call the same family. We ensure that one agency is dedicated to working, saying we have a program space and we're gonna meet the need of this family. We're gonna track them down and serve them. <coughs> um, we also have, as people have heard about already, I'm sure, and, and we'll hear about more today, affordable housing funds in the city and county that are helping make progress on the issue of family homelessness. Um, we have strong referral partners in wraparound services, so things like childcare, home visiting, mental health supports, all these things really create coordination and efficiency in our system. Um, put the road homes programs here on the bottom part of the slide, and that's showing how we fit in and, and create a continuum of care based on a family's needs. So if it is determined that a road home program is the right fit, for a family, we're gonna find what program is best to meet the family's needs. Because sometimes the family's falling into homelessness because of one or two stumbling blocks. Other times, there's generational poverty to address. So we're gonna meet those needs very differently. So we have programs ranging from rapid rehousing, that might be a short term, three to six month, intensive case management and some rent subsidies, all the way up to permanent supportive housing that could last as long as a child in the household is under 18. So we're really making sure to find best fit supports for families in need to ensure they can feel empowered to move forward and be successful. Um, the last thing that I want to touch on about our organization is that we're moving into this exciting and innovative space and probably what's on the top of mind here at our conference today of affordable housing development and partnerships. So one thing that's happened recently um, is we've been partnering with Stonehouse Development to open just between nine and 10, I think maybe up to 12 units in um, 
three buildings. One already is open, the Breeze, that's the rough sketch shown in the picture here, where there's nine units for families that are exiting shelter to live in this mixed income development. And the Road Home comes in, has a case manager and an office on site at the Breeze for those nine families. We have two more similar buildings opening up in the next year at Fair Oaks and Schrader Road. Um, also mentioned here is that the Road Home actually owns themselves 30 units of affordable housing that were able to keep affordable um, into perpetuity, which is really wonderful for these 30 units of permanent supportive housing and the families that live there. Um, we do always mention that we like to keep property management and case management separate because property management is related to paying rent and being a tenant. Case management is related to supporting a family's goals holistically. And we don't like to be in the spot of having a case manager at the road home needing to evict potentially a family. So in all our affordable housing partnerships, we're making sure that property management and case management are thought of as two different things. And we're providing the case management piece. Uh, the last thing I'll mention before I hand it off to my colleagues um, is just a few ways to think about working together with the road home if any of this is piquing your interest. We have what we call tours for families at our office over on Winger Drive. Um, we have two of those coming up in the remainder of this year. Um, we also have what everyone else has, Facebook, Instagram, whatever, all those things, feel free to follow us. We often, I think the most useful tool in this case is we post wish lists that are often good for um, companies, small groups, departments, whatever it may be, to do donation drives for our families. Um, and the last thing is if you are thinking about if you're in a municipality or a different area that's starting to take steps toward affordable housing development, have some developers ready to take that step and want to house families, please feel free to reach out, particularly to our executive director, Kristen Rosinski, and talk about the fact, talk about with her what the Road Home does for support services and how you could potentially consider having the Road Home as a partner in the support services that you're offering in your area. Um, I will, with that, hand it over, and we will have time for questions as a group at the end. Thank you. My name is Katherine Auerbach. I'm the executive director of Moving Out. And um, we are a nonprofit housing organization. We have um, been around for about 25 years. Um, we'll be celebrating our 25th anniversary next year. Um, I will just kind of move quickly through these slides. I want to make sure we have enough time for, for a good discussion um, later on. Um, our mission is about um, partnering with um, individuals and families um, with disabilities to create safe, affordable, community-integrated <coughs> housing. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about specifically what we mean by some of those terms. Um, for us, as an organization, we were founded by a, a group of parents of adult children with disabilities who... Um, at that time, just a little over a generation ago, um, we're faced with really zero options outside of an institutional setting or the family home for um, their adult children with disabilities to live once they were no longer able to, to provide that support. Um, so they were looking down the road to a time when they wouldn't be around anymore and um, in conversation and dialogue with their own children and with this group um, really um, ran up against a, a, a wall in trying to find these options in the community. They didn't exist at that time. A place where um, people with disabilities could live in regular housing outside of those kinds of institutional settings, whether it's a large institution or a group home, any sort of licensed facility. They really wanted the opportunity to have um, regular housing, regular neighbors, and have all the kinds of opportunities that um, we all take for granted in terms of our day-to-day -day decisions about our lives. What time do we get up? What time do we have breakfast? Who comes into our home and when to do what to whom? Um, those kinds of things that, um, that many of us probably take for granted. So the type of, of housing that we create is always community integrated, meaning it is scattered throughout a neighborhood or throughout any particular apartment building. Um, we don't do congregation or clustering of any kind. So if we create a new apartment building, um, a 
percentage, no more than 25% of those units are set aside as supportive units for um, households that include someone with a disability, and those are always scattered throughout the project. They are not all on one floor, they're not all in one building, they're not all down at the end of one hallway, and that's very, very intentional, and that guides every decision that we make as an organization. We're very focused on that integration piece. And um, I can talk all day about why that's important, but one of the main reasons that's important is not only better for people with disabilities, it's better for the whole community. We're missing out on opportunities um, to en enjoy and benefit from the gifts and value um, that people with disabilities have to offer to our community when we um, cluster them or hide them away um, and, and don't interact with them as neighbors or co-workers or um, human beings in our, in our presence. Um, Self-determination is um, to that point that I spoke about making choices in our daily lives and um, being able to choose those kinds of things that we take for granted in many institutional settings. That's not the case. There's breakfast is served at a certain time, supportive services are offered at a certain time, you're going to get your bath when your person shows up to give you your bath, not when you want to have your bath. And those may seem um, insignificant, but they add up to uh, really a different kind of life um, of, of dignity and humanity when people have the opportunity to make those kinds of choices themselves. That's, um, again, something that guides our decision making around keeping our housing and supportive services separate. So our organization does not provide supportive services, but we partner with organizations that do, like the Road Home and, and others that provide more specific um, in-home care services. And again, that goes to um, providing opportunity for people to make their own choices. And then partnership and collaboration, we work really um, in that spirit with um, residents, with families, with other community organizations and other developers. Um, since the time that our organization was founded, we've helped over 1,600 families to become first-time homeowners. So our organization started out um, focused on home ownership. We administer a, a range of, of programs that are essentially all publicly funded um, to provide um, housing counseling and down payment assistance as well as other financial assistance for um, maintaining safety and accessibility of homes. And um, these are, of course, um, families that meet criteria for income and um, disability, and we have helped families in all but I think two counties in Wisconsin to become homeowners. Um, we have um, worked with families to provide um, housing counseling that incorpor incorporates a range of assistance in helping people move through the process of determining what kind of housing um, is going to best fit their needs. Uh, we've worked with people on a range of um, needs from people who may need 24-7 supportive services um, to people who are essentially independent and maybe need very little supportive services, but um, have a range of housing needs as a result of that. Um, we provide home buyer education that's free and available to anyone in the community, um, regardless of, of income or ability. And um, as I mentioned, that safety and accessibility modification piece is really important for helping people to stay in their homes once they have a home, because people's needs change over time. Um, this concept of aging in place is really important. And um, as Sarah mentioned, you know, getting um, stabilized in housing is very important. So all of our efforts focus around helping make sure that people can remain in their homes for a very long time. Um, about 12, 13 years ago now, we started, um, initially started out in de development of multifamily properties in partnership with other developers, and we've started doing more developments on our own. In that time, we've helped create over a thousand units of affordable housing, and these are throughout the state, mostly in the southern part of the state, and about half of those units are in Dane County. 
So about 500 units in Dane County, and then about a quarter of those are those supportive units for people with disabilities. So in our efforts to create community integrated housing for people with disabilities, the happy sort of side effect is that we create lots and lots of affordable housing. Again, um, I'll echo um, our uh, speakers this morning. Uh, it's not anywhere near enough. Um, we uh, maintain an interest list and a there are always um, upwards of 400 people on our list at any time. We have um, a new uh, multifamily projects in the works, and as soon as people hear about them, they start asking to be put on an interest list to find out when um, the applications will be available. We have um, a project in another project in the works in Madison currently that won't even break ground until next spring, and we already have almost 200 people on a list um, interested in even applying for a unit there. That's gonna be, you know, like 70 some units. So the need obviously continues to grow. And like Sarah said, um, you know, we're growing as an organization, but it, it's unfortunate that we need to continue growing as an organization to continue trying to address this, this challenge. Um, our units are uh, typically mixed income, meaning um, a certain number of the units are designated for people at those different ranges of um, percentages of the county median income. We have a range of rental types, um, apartments, single family homes, and duplexes. We have a portfolio of about 60 of uh, those, what we call scattered site properties that, um, again, both the upside and the downside of that, um, they're almost never <coughs> vacant, which is good because that means that the families living in them are really, really stable and they stay there for a very long time, but that means that we very rarely have opportunities for other people to move in. Um, and then we, um, we focus on, like I said, ma helping make sure that people have success as, <laughs> as residents in, in their homes. And um, we have um, recognized that, um, again, as Sarah said, it's important to keep those supportive services separate from property management. So we work with third party property management firms and we work with, um, property management firms that have lots of experience um, working with uh, affordable housing and the kinds of populations that we serve. Nevertheless, they're not caseworkers, they're not social workers, they're not supportive um, service providers. And so uh, we wanna make sure that we're meeting the holistic needs of our residents so that they can stay for a long time and be healthy and happy. So there's a little bit of a gap sometimes between what supportive service agencies provide and what property managers provide. So we fill that gap with what we call our resident success or tenant success programs. And we're developing that um, into a more robust program that's um, designed to be uh, helping to make connections and build social capital. Those are the things that are needed for people to have that kind of long-term success. And we're taking an asset-based community development approach to this work, meaning that we're building on the gifts and talents and interest and skills of our residents to help them make connections with their neighbors and um, both in the apartments and beyond. And um, build the kinds of relationships that can help people solve problems themselves. And um, there are lots of ways that we're happy to connect with you. If you're interested, we're happy to come to your community or organization to share information about the kinds of services and programs and developments that we're involved with and the things that we can do, the ways we can partner with other organizations and communities. Um, we're of course on social media and um, we have a quarterly e-newsletter. If you'd like to get plugged into that, you can visit our website to subscribe. And we're happy to um, share what we've built with you. Um, if you'd ever like to come and take a tour of our properties that are um, in Dane County, we're happy to, to show you around. Um, we're very proud of the work that we've done because um, the residents 
tell us that they're very happy living in our properties and um, they're doing well and they're thriving and um, we would love to work with your community to do more. Hi, I'm Lori Heineman. I'm the president of Madison Development Corporation. And it's really great to hear the comments from both uh, Sarah and Catherine because I learned more about their organizations. I've been at MDC for only about three years, but the organization has been around for over 40 years. We basically do two key things. One is we provide workforce housing, which we define as people with incomes who make between 40 to 80 percent of the area median income. And we currently have 15 sites, primarily in Madison, uh, but some in Middleton. And those consist of 305 units. Of the 305 units that we have, 72% um, of those are rented to people whose household incomes are under 60% of the area median income. So that is the majority of our um, revenues. 80% of our revenues are driven by workforce housing. The second one is we provide lending and investments for small neighborhood businesses here in Dane County. Uh, things like we were the first lender to um, Willie Street Co-op, as well as um, Monty's Blue Plate Diner, and great places like Rock Hound Brewing Company, and Per Blue Entertainment, as well as Nordic Consulting. We gave Mark back in his first loan. So that's a really kind of fun side of it. And the only reason I mention that, because we're now kind of marrying the two, if you will, and we're going to be working with a group of corporate leaders here in Madison called the Economic Stability Council, um, who has been a partner with the United Way to identify really the most important issue on economic stability for the citizens of Dane County, and that was the lack of affordable workforce housing. So that's a project that we'll be taking on, hopefully at the beginning of next year, being driven again by several different investors that um, are represented by the major employers and they see their workforce, the people that work for them, having to drive long distances just to be able to make it into work, which is inefficient, expensive, and it's exhausting to have you know an hour commute one way just to make it into your job. So they see it as an issue and we'll be working with them on that. So I wanted to go a little bit different route than both Catherine and Sarah have to talk about uh, workforce housing because I'm the newbie here. Um, I, I'm still in a steep learning uh, mode, but the one thing I do realize and really value is that nonprofits provide affordable workforce housing for the long term, in other words, permanent. So let's kind of talk about that for a minute because what we do is we buy, we own, we develop, and we manage affordable workforce housing. And we do that um, with several different sources of funding. And it's important to know that when you're buying or you're um, building affordable housing, that the source of funding determines what your rents will be controlled by. So in the case, and I'll show one of um, the examples, in the case of these three examples, we have on the left-hand side were the Dane townhomes. Um, the Dane townhomes are 12 townhomes that are uh, located on South Park. And they're primarily for families, two to three bedrooms. The 431 West Mifflin Street is in the heart of Mifflin Street. It's a 46 unit, but it is not student housing. It is, again, for people who make between 40 to 80 percent of the area median income. We combined those two properties into a $7 million Dane County uh, Housing Authority tax exempt bond and locked in a rate for a period of, I'm trying to think about that one, I think it's probably 15 years. And as long as we keep those rents affordable, we're able to do two things. One, we are able to keep the rents down because of the fact that most of our, those units are rented to people under 60% of the area median income, which in the city of Madison gives us some tax exemption on those particular units. Now, there are some units that are what we consider at market, and those we do pay real estate taxes on. So I don't think a lot of people understand that, that nonprofits we don't have to pay taxes necessarily, or we get a payment in lieu of taxes on, on the units that are affordable, but we do have to pay taxes on the ones that are above that 60% or 80%, depending on you know the municipalities. The last project I wanted to talk a little bit about is the Avenue, and that's the project we're working on right now. 
Uh, let's, let's go back to kind of talking about the area median income. Now, if you go to the U.S. Census data, you'll see the county median income in Dane County is about $67,000. However, that's not what HUD uses. HUD uses what's called the area median income. And the area median income estimated for 2019 from the HUD website is $100,400 for Dane County, which is really high. So now if I'm, my target is renting to people who make between 40 to 80% of the area median income, I'm looking at households that make 40 to $80,000. And the rents that I'm going to charge is gonna depend on the household income. In other words, anybody who's on the lease who makes an income, we combine those two. And then also the household size. So both um, Sarah and Catherine were talking a little bit about a three bedroom. So at Madison Development Corporation, we buy, own, manage, and develop. We do all of our own property management, but we don't provide services. So we really focus on fair housing, making sure that we have accessible housing, um, and making sure we have universally designed housing, if at all possible, for people of all mobility levels. So this particular project is our first um, universal design. If I go back to that previous slide, you'll see, and now, when you drive out of town, this is 1954 East Washington. It's right on the main 151 corridor, right up from First Street. This is on the corner of Second Street and um, uh, the 1900 block of East Washington. This is a former UW hospital, and it's a 28 unit, and we're in the process of renovating that. Um, but one of the things we found out is we have several people with uh, mobility challenges or in wheelchairs in this particular property. And so what we're doing with this, this is right next door to it. It's called the Grass Camp. It's a 44 unit new development. And you know, if you go back to that other development I showed you, that's under, and I'm sure you guys probably know what this is, but I didn't know what it was when I started, so I'll just mention it. It's under a land use restriction agreement, 30 year land use restriction agreement. So that means that the tax credits that were used, um, Wisconsin Housing and Economic Development put a land use restriction underneath it, saying that the rents have to be affordable for at least 30 years. This particular property is coming out of that restriction December 31st, 2020. So if I put my nonprofit hat on, and I'm a mission-based organization, I wanna build more affordable units and keep it permanently affordable on that parcel. If I'm a for-profit developer, I, I have some choices. I could either sell it at market and then it comes off, off, the, off the affordable housing rolls. And so when the mayor mentioned earlier this morning, she wants to keep affordable housing affordable, it's because these land use restrictions are expiring. So the one thing as a nonprofit, that I, I think is really, really important is if the villages and the cities around the area put those land use restriction agreements on to keep them affordable, that's a positive thing for us because we're gonna be interested in keeping it affordable long-term and, and that's why Kathy was smart to put on, you know, permanent uh, workforce housing is what nonprofit um, developers provide. So this is also um, something I wanna introduce the idea of, it's called universal design. And of course, Catherine does this in her properties because she serves people with disabilities at all different levels. And my guess is that they're all pretty easy to get in and out of if you're in a wheelchair. Universal design is just making the unit itself very easy to use if you happen to be in a scooter or a wheelchair or have some um, physical um, condition that uh, doesn't give you full control. So we are putting in um, on our entire first floor roll-in showers. We're putting in pull-out dishwashers. All of the doors will not be opening into you. They will be sliding to the side. Um, the cabinets will actually be on the counters versus up high. And it'll be very easy for anybody to use. It's called universal design. We also have two full ADA ones, but universal design will pretty much get 99% you know, percent of people around without um, the additional requirements. So we're very excited about that concept. Um, we're working with the um, uh, Jane Nemke Earl, who is uh, on the Disability Commission here in um, the city of Madison, and we're really excited about incorporating that. The other thing you'll see in the front is this is going to be a universally designed park, and there are two of them already in Madison, Elver Park and Birmingham Park, and the most expensive thing in this park, I'm going to ask, I'm going to give you guys three options. Mm -hmm. One, the playground equipment, yeah. two, the landscaping, or three, the base of the park. Let's say. Who, all, who picks number one, the playground equipment? Okay, how about number two, the landscaping? 
How about number three, the base of the park? Yeah, you, you, guys are, you guys are old hats at this. Quarter million dollars for that poured in place. It's called poured in place. Why is that important when you're doing universal design? Because wood chips, rocks get caught in, caught in wheels. And so this will be a poured in place, hopefully, if I can raise the money, um, and it costs a quarter million dollars. That being said, you know, we're welcome to put a logo on that poured in place, so <laughs> anybody. And those are, the, those are the end of my formal comments. I know you want to get to the question and answer session, but you know, we're really honored to be here in Madison. Um, just so you know, our portfolio, we don't provide services um, like both Sarah and Catherine um, do, and they partner very uh, uh, closely on that. What we do is we provide affordable workforce housing, we manage the properties, and if someone is in need of services, we connect them to resources. So we're kind of a um, very focused on just building and developing our footprint here in the Dane County area. Okay, thank you. Uh, do people have questions either about uh, what their organizations do or other organizations? Yeah. So um, I coordinate two um, programs. One of them is a permanent supportive housing program for folks who are chronically homeless and disabled. Um, it is scattered site unit. So one thing I I think is a concern in my everyday job is keeping folks housed. Um, with getting folks housed who have extreme barriers, I'm talking like extreme barriers, like things on their record regarding prostitution or you know um, really heavy and dark things that that I deal with, um, and having it be super hard to obtain housing even in places that are developed and managed by organizations such as you all. So um, I end up in predicaments where I have specific landlords that will work with folks who won't do background checks, because anybody sees that background, there's, if you literally have to find somebody who's not gonna check background. And with that is you get landlords who aren't equipped um, to work with folks that have these barriers. Um, or mental health issues or any of these things. So then it ends up being a, um, even though we're operating under a housing first module and understanding that um, it is permanent supportive housing and they do have that, that support there, um, we're still not getting the support from the community, right? I feel mm -hmm. like it's kind of where, I don't know if it's a statement or a question, it's yeah. kind of want to know like, what can we do to support folks that are high barriers that have um, high levels of mental health issues. Um, I have folks that have burned all their bridges. Can this, can we have sec second chances? Can there be a, a plan of rehabilitating? Because um, the folks that aren't checking backgrounds are also not fixing things. Right. You know, yeah. and they're not providing. You know, like as, as they were talking in the, in the first um, <coughs> panel, they were talking about providing healthy housing and things like that, but you know, the folks that aren't checking backgrounds aren't aren't changing light bulbs, they're not checking for mold. And um, I really want to be able to kind of repair these relationships, but with that there has to be some sort of like forgiveness, mm -hmm. like second chances and things of that nature. So I don't know what you guys have to say about that. Well I you know both um, Catherine and Sarah pointed out the sort of distinction between property management and case management. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and like Lori, at the partnership, we own properties, <laughs> rental properties, and we rent to people coming from graduate housing programs, and you know, so we use loosened background checks. And I think that one of the critical things in, in talking to other landlords um, who do what we do is that case management component. Mm -hmm. And um, if you, if, as, as a landlord, I'm happy to rent to someone and give them, um, not check their background, you know, not worry about whether they've been evicted or, you know, those are the kinds of families that as a nonprofit I'm happy to take. Mm -hmm. But I also need that case management right, right. support so that's provide, really, really strong. And I have found that that's really where, um, you know, if, if you reach out to a landlord and, um, you know, in apartment associations, what they talk about is, hey, you know, we did this, we tried it once, and the case management wasn't there, so we aren't going to do it again. And, and so I think there does have to be a level of trust built up. Uh, and it's really important that those two components be kept separate and that both parties hold up their end of the deal. And you know, maybe you have some things to add to that. But. 
Yeah, I can jump in just to talk a little bit about the community conversations that are going on around that nationally. There's some best practices that are starting to emerge for building up and shoring up landlord relationships because we have to, I think it's easy, I know for me in the nonprofit space and with my like soft heart, it's easy to be like, landlords are the, the worst, you know, this is the problem. But their landlords, whether individual or large, companies are, are, have to make a bottom line too, right? They have to make, make ends meet for their business. And so across the country, what we're starting to see is these ideas of like landlord mitigation funds, for example. So what if the community, the Homeless Services Consortium could have a landlord mitigation fund that's sort of providing some extra support and telling the landlord there's, if there are damages that happen, we have, we're going to try and have more money, um, to, like sort of extra insurance almost, right? Mm -hmm. To try and incentivize a landlord to take that potentially a riskier step for their business model. Right. Um, similarly, the idea of maybe a 24-7 call line for landlords that are not equipped to deal with um, social service issues is their potential for our community. We've seen it starting to happen in some other communities to have a call line um, that's, that's serviced, whether it's by the HSC overall or by agencies taking days or hours to, to man that line. So landlords know there's a, there's a first call that they can make before the police or before an eviction notice goes out. There, there's, there's some more support built in. So at a lot of the like National Alliance to End Homelessness conferences that people from our community are attending, we're trying to ask those questions and see who's ahead of us because we know people are ahead of where we're at in Dane County, um, but we need to we're, we need to strive for that. I'll just add maybe a little um, information to perhaps help provide some understanding for where some of that is coming from. For um, in some cases, as um, Lori mentioned the funding sources often dictate a lot of details about an apartment building. Um, a lot of the developments that Moving Out has done in uh, the last 12 or 13 years, um, two things. One, they've been, many of them in partnership with for-profit developers as we built up our um, resources and capacity to do developments ourselves. Um, so in many cases, the, the properties that we're involved with, we have some influence, but we don't always have control. Mm -hmm. Our, the, we're not the majority owner. We're not, um, we don't, we're not holding like the financial guarantees, that sort of financial component. And um, the other piece is that many of the developments that we've done have been funded by low income housing tax credits and those are sold to investors. And so the investors mm -hmm. often are, um, risk averse and they often dictate what we can and can't include in, in tenant screening. Um, so there's some forces that we're, we're constantly trying to balance the forces of what is required by our funding and what is required by um, also fair housing laws. So for example, um, we had a situation recently where we were trying desperately to help um, a young woman with uh, pretty severe disabilities to get housing stabilized. Um, and um, we had provided her a sort of temporary solution. Um, some of our apartment buildings have guest suites and so sometimes we've <laughs> partnered with people to um, use those guest suites as sort of temporary um, housing. That's really not what we typically um, we're not in the temporary housing business, but we're, we're grateful that sometimes we have these spaces that we can, can um, turn to. And we um, were providing that guest suite to her while we were trying, working with other agencies and organizations trying to find a more permanent solution for her. And we um, had an opening in the building and um, we were able to um, get her application completed and then our property management partner ran the application through the process and it turned out that she had an eviction on her record that we didn't know about in advance and that disqualified her and, and there was really nothing that we could do because we weren't the primary owner, we didn't have control and we couldn't ask the property manager to make an exception for any one individual because then you're in violation of fair housing laws if you don't treat every single applicant the same. So it gets super complicated and even as much as we sometimes would 
really want to be able to make an exception for people. Sometimes our hands are tied because of those kinds of uh, limitations. We're moving towards doing more of our own development so that we do have more control and can make more of those decisions. Also, I'll say that D Dane County um, has done a tremendous mm -hmm. job in the last year, um, an effort by um, one of our county supervisors, Heidi Wegleitner, um, kind of led the charge on addressing some of the um, tenant screening criteria that um, will be tied to funding from the Dane County Affordable Housing Fund. And we worked really closely with the county and other groups and third sector in general, um, providing feedback on some of those early ideas to address this issue. And um, they've come up with some, I think, really innovative um, approaches and we were able to um, incorporate those into our last uh, round of applications. So uh, two, uh, it's, I don't think it's finalized yet, but two of our upcoming projects that are hopefully gonna be receiving Dane County um, affordable housing funds um, will have the new tenant screening criteria that, that will help address some of these challenges. Mm -hmm. And I would just second what Catherine's saying. The Dane County Affordable Housing Fund targets those exact bases that you cannot discriminate. And I, you know, don't quote me word for word, but we did not, and Madison Development Corporation did not apply for that. We're not prepared to serve um, that market. Um, but it's, it's basically um, you cannot discriminate based on a criminal record or on a, does it also include on a previous ev eviction, very low to moderate income, mm -hmm. like below, many have to be below 30% of the area median income. And so the Dane County Affordable Housing Fund is really focused on trying to serve that market. So if I were you and you're looking to, you know, find spots for people, I would find out who the recipients of those grants were and who, uh, who they are. And I'd call those companies because every single nonprofit is different. We all have different screening criteria, but we have to be consistent and follow the fair housing laws. So, but we all have a little bit different screening criteria and it's driven by that source of funds. Thank you. I'm sorry, who's again? Well, it's the Affordable Housing Fund for the Dane County and that's what um, Parisi said this morning. He talked about that and how they've increased the size of it. And so I think the grant requests come out in, is it June maybe for Dane County Housing? Affordable they're, Housing? They're just um, currently, yeah. We're, it's like once a year, Yeah, right? we're, um, they're just making final, they're just finalizing decisions for um, funding recipients for this year's round. Yeah. May. Yeah, May or June. May. Same thing with the city of Madison yeah. comes out. Okay, one more question. Um, once a year. Question. Right. Um, but the tenants that you may have might need right. social work or um, transportation. Exactly. Um, so like yeah. you kind of throw on there. And right. I'm just wondering what made you look into that community? So there, the answer to that question is it's complicated and it depends. Um, but essentially um, I'll, what I'll share is that we um, – we're working um, and very, well, actually moving, moving people in currently into a new property in um, Platteville. And Platteville previously didn't have any community integrated, any community integrated um, independent living options um, of this type. Um, so we had to work closely with the managed care organizations and supportive service agencies to actually move into that market with us where that, because that, that's really our model is, is um, for, for making this work for community integrated living for people with disabilities is there has to be that, that network, right, of, of in-home care services and that managed care system, the long-term care system in Wisconsin that funds that, every, all those pieces have to be in place. So for communities that don't have that in place, but that recognize they need affordable housing and they want community integrated housing for people with disabilities, um, we were very open to um, collaborating with the managed care organizations and the supportive service agencies and other pieces of that network that need to be in place to go to help create this model in a community where it doesn't already exist. Essentially, um, it's a huge, huge challenge in rural communities where um, 
even with low income housing tax credits or other types of funding to support affordable housing development, there's still often a funding gap. So in Dane County, we're just talking about the affordable housing development fund in Dane County. Lots of counties in Wisconsin, I would say most counties in Wisconsin don't have that. Um, so when we're looking at development in, in more rural communities or other parts of the state, um, we're looking at um, innovative funding sources to close that gap. So the fund that Lori just mentioned is one approach. There are a number of other approaches that are happening. WIDA is working hard to address that funding gap for some of the um, rural communities in particular. Um, but it comes down to having a, a site, having the political will, having community support. Um, if the community support and the political will and, and the location is available, we can usually figure out the funding. Oftentimes it comes down to that community support. Zoning. Comprehensive plans that include regions or affordable housing super important it is and we just had a situation where you know we were um, invited to provide a to submit a proposal for an affordable housing development in a, in a uh, community in um, a more rural part of the state but but a, a, an urban ish center and um, the city staff was on board the, the land use was everything lined up um, they sent this asked us to give a proposal we submit the proposal it meets all the requirements that there meets everything that they're looking for it's really innovative partnerships we're all fired up about it and then the city council is like well we didn't mean right there <coughs> so it, you know it really comes down to making sure that you know the whole community is aligned around all the things that have come up already this morning, right? We don't want those people right there, really. We really want them sort of over there. Um, that's got to be that's got to be addressed. All right. Well, I think they want us to move.